Hey everyone, welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, I am your host for these things. Uh, as I record this, it is about 7 a.m. in the morning as I am uh, putting together this episode, which is uh, Mr. Venom, a.k.a. Jerry Cortez, and I discussing Bride of Frankenstein. This is a great conversation. We are both in love with this movie. We both love the filmmaking behind this movie and are just absolutely chomping at the bit to uh, impress one another with the things that we know about it. And it's a, a, a really good time. Uh, I think you're going to be really pleased with uh, how this episode goes and uh, the conversation we have about this movie and all of the things that we we love and find amazing about it. Bride of Frankenstein is one of those movies that, that, that sort of transcends even the universal horror monsters. It, it's just such a weird piece of filmmaking. And made by a guy, James Whale, who didn't really want to make a sequel to Frankenstein. And if he was going to make a sequel to Frankenstein, he was going to make it his way. And he was going to make it uh, a movie that he found entertaining and weird and wonderful which is the kind of person James Whale was. So this film is the result of that, and and oh my goodness, is it good. So uh, we have extended the Juniversal season somewhat. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit more on the back end of this conversation. Uh, so stick around after this, uh, this recording uh, uh, that you're about to hear with Jerry and I uh, for a little bit of an update on sort of the schedule of Dark Parade moving forward. Um, and that's it. See you on the other side. Enjoy. Well, folks, as, uh, promised, we have assembled, once again, we have gone to the lab and assembled, a a, a just a, a cavalcade of body parts. And the result was my guest tonight. And, uh, and that is, of course, a returning champion, Mr. Venom. Uh, is here and man i am so excited about this i am too brother greetings and salutations gods and monsters yes i am very excited to be here as you know we are discussing my favorite universal monster movie ever so i'm as giddy as a little girl yeah i you know here's the thing going back doing a whole month of this i was i was kind of afraid hey i'm i'm setting myself up for a lot of sameness in, in mm-hmm. terms of the discussions. And I don't think that's the case really, because uh, with all of the movies that I've, I've had the conversation so far and the ones to come, they're surprisingly different movies. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe that's because we're not doing like the OG Dracula. We're not doing the original Frankenstein, mm-hmm. but um, let me, let me just start where we normally do. Which is to ask, like, where did you first encounter Bride of Frankenstein in your your filmic journey? Hmm. Bride of Frankenstein actually came a little bit later for me. Um, I was already, like, heavy into the early 80s slasher movement before I even really started looking at Universal Monster movies. Now, I had watched some remakes, obviously, some Draculas and some Frankensteins here and there, but I hadn't watched the originals. It, It was probably in my late teens uh probably 18 19 years old that i finally saw um dracula which was the first universal horror that i actually sat down to watch as an adult and appreciate um not one of my favorites by the way but that's a conversation for another day yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a reason we're not doing it this this year (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> damn right um as far as bride goes i think i saw bride maybe i want to say early 90s so probably in my early 20s it would have been a year or two after i watched the original frankenstein and believe it or not it didn't hit me the way it does now like obviously you know almost 30 years ago we're we're, we're totally different people you know our tastes are you know everything is different So when I first saw it, I actually thought it was a little dull because it's not much of a horror movie. Now, it's literally one of my favorite Universal Monster movies because it's not much of a horror movie. There's so much more to this than just, you know, thrills and chills that, I mean, the movie has so much to say about multiple topics, which I'm sure we'll get into here. 
um, that subtext, that social commentary, just so much of this movie spoke to me over the years. The more I watch it, the more I develop an appreciation for it. And, you know, kind of as most of us, as a lot of us do, we kind of look at ourselves as outcasts, you know, maybe not the coolest kids in school or whatever. So stories like Frankenstein and Wolfman always kind of gravitated uh, to me. I just appreciated the kind of, you know, the dichotomy of like, here is a socially awkward entity that also isn't accepted by society and doesn't have a lot of friends and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you kind of, you, de you develop a bond with these characters. And, you know, I was a big kid in school. So yeah, Frankenstein was kind of the creature that I kind of looked at myself as. Not in the sense that I was put together by dead body parts mm -hmm. by any stretch, but um, just like I said, the... The, the way that the the quote unquote cool people of the village look down at him, the fact that he has no friends, the fact that as soon as he makes a friend, it's taken away from him. I mean, this story is so tragic and so emotional that every time I watch it, I, I just take more out of the film. So yeah, it's a no brainer that this is my absolute favorite Universal monster movie. Yeah, I I think you and I have a, a similar experience with this movie in that I didn't see this. Like, I saw Wolfman and Dracula and uh, the, the original Frankenstein. Um, I saw all those real early. Like, that was kind of a Saturday afternoon creature feature kind of thing. And uh, I was still of an age where, uh, you know, that that was a thing. I, 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 and not to detour immediately, but it's something I've been reflecting on a lot is the this notion of like oh you just watched whatever was on because you only had five channels <laughs> and so the local uh like uhf channel would would show you know the creature features on saturday <laughs> afternoons about two o'clock <laughs> when my my folks were trying to chase me out of the house to be you know a productive child in any way and i was like <laughs> you guys but gamera is on <laughs> but, but so i i watched that stuff and i don't know that i i don't have a recollection of seeing bride of frankenstein prior to you know my teenage years and and i think i had the same reaction where when i when i saw it for the first time i was like the bride of frankenstein ain't in this much and <laughs> uh, how disappointing uh i found it and as I've revisited it, like there was that that golden viewing of it when I was probably in my twenties, mm -hmm. where I realized, like, oh my god, this movie is amazing, you know, yeah. it be, be, because of what you said, because it's not just like you know, here's the monster, here are the villagers, here's the woman in peril, here's the mad doctor who who has created Frankenstein and so forth which is fine like the original Frankenstein is a good movie and I think we'll talk mm -hmm. about James Whale a lot I'm sure <laughs> but Bride of Frankenstein I think it's because James Whale didn't want to do a sequel yeah and when you know the the story goes I'm not telling Venom anything he don't know but for the listeners <laughs> when the story goes that they wanted a sequel pretty quick and James Whale was like no way I've why would I make a sequel to anything that I've done? Because I've already done it. And he wanted to do other movies. And, and basically the only reason he got, you know, sort of cajoled into doing Bride of Frankenstein was so that they would fund another movie of his. Mm -hmm. And in, so in approaching the material, it wasn't like he was out to make, a universal monster movie. He just wanted to make a movie that he thought would be a hoot. Mm -hmm. And, um, did, have, did you hear the story of him in the theater, uh, laughing at the movie? I don't think so. No. Oh, so this was after the movie came out and so forth. And, but there is a story that he was in the movie theater, just it, not a screening room, but an actual theater watching it with an audience. And just cackling, like a, a real like Max Cady with the cigar kind of thing. <laughs> and a woman spun on him in this theater and was like, if you don't like the movie, you can leave. 
And he, he's like, Madam, I love this movie. <laughs> you know, like, like it, the, the whale had this appreciation of Bride of Frankenstein as sort of camp before <laughs> there was such a thing as camp. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, James Whale just blows my mind. Like, he's such a brilliant director, not just for the time that he was making films, but just in general. And uh, this movie, I think, may be. Whether he likes it or not, I think this may be James Whale's masterpiece. Oh, I absolutely believe that. I mean, the form and function of this film are just above anything I've seen James Whale do before this. Just all the different aspects that he checks, all the commentary, whether intentional or not, because from watching the special features, I mean... James Whale didn't really intend to have a lot of subtext in this movie, but obviously over the years, um, it's kind of, it's, it's become its own, no pun intended, but it's kind of become its own little monster where it's, (laughs) it's literally people are seeing it in different ways. And obviously, you know, with the, with the big homosexual movement of the seventies and eighties, sixties, seventies and eighties, you know, this film just starts developing more appreciation, more cinephiles, are finding out about it and, you know, discovering the greatness that is the Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, that's so good. All right, well, let, let, let's let's trot through the plot. This won't take too terribly long, I don't think, because yep. it's not a terribly long movie. I think it's 75 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, originally was 92 and was cut down uh, largely. A lot of it was cut down because uh, the, the monster murdered a bunch more people. And they cut a bunch of that out because the the I think it was the Hayes Commission at the time. Yeah, the ratings board. Yeah, yeah um, <laughs> basically said like, look, you can't just have him. According to the list that we have compiled, he has strangled on screen no less than twenty two people, <laughs> and we've got to we got to trim some of that down. Uh, so they did anyway. Got it down to a. Uh, a rock in 75 minutes and the the movie begins with this sort of parlor moment where mm-hmm. you have uh Percy Shelley, Lord Byron and Mary Shelley all hanging out in you know their their den by the fire as Uno O'Connor walks some dogs away uh <laughs> and god bless Uno O'Connor by the way um yeah, and they're they're just kind of chit chatty. Especially Lord Byron is really making a kind of a grandstanding speech about this monster that Mary Shelley created and how wonderful it was. Mm-hmm. And there, this is one of the first moments where stuff gets cut out of Bride of Frankenstein because originally Mary Shelley has this comment about them being. Uh, sort of beholden to no one that they're they're all sort of infidels because they're all chasing their own pleasures and the implication being rightly so that they were all just fucking each other Mm -hmm. and (laughs) doing absinthe like you just go watch gothic if you want to get a a, a closer look at that (laughs) um probably not strictly historically accurate but the spirit i think is there yeah i'll go with it and she says like no 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 i was trying to basically uh impart a lesson that that you can't go around playing god because there are consequences but she says there is more of this story to tell yeah and And, man i i appreciate james Wales so much for this intro Universal, I'm sure you know, Universal didn't want to do this intro. They thought it just didn't set the right tone for the start of a, of a Universal monster movie. And James Whale fought for this scene, and I'm so glad he did. Even though we ended up getting, you know, a kind of abridged version of it from what he shot, I absolutely adore this scene. And I, I, I actually think it's a perfect intro. I love seeing these three interact, you know? People that, that obviously... Um, people that we would never see since they died hundreds of years before we lived, or at least, you know, dozens of years before we lived. Um, so just seeing that and, and honestly getting that little preview of, you know, Elsa Lanchester always mm-hmm. appreciated. Yeah. And <laughs> they, I think they're, they cut some shots out because it, it was a little too leering of, of Elsa Lancaster and her, her breasticles. Mm-hmm. Can't show a 17-year-old's boobs in 1935. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, it's great because uh, you know it, it, the, in the credits they uh, refer to the mate or the casting of the mate with just a question mark. But it's a great bit of casting to have her sort of yes. as she's telling the story. The implication is she casts herself in that role mm-hmm. in in the telling of the story, which is really wonderful. But yeah, so. As she begins the story, we fade in. We, it, it's a real, like, last time on Frankenstein. <laughs> as, as you see, like, oh, Frankenstein killed this little girl and went on a rampage and was created by Dr. Frankenstein. And then he ends up uh, going to this burning windmill. And everyone, uh, like, it, it, they set fire. The villagers set fire to it. And, and mm-hmm. you know, the monster is killed. And, uh, but of course, this being a sequel, uh, they're like, oh, but here's what really happened. And so after this windmill has kind of burned and collapsed and so forth, the father of the girl that Frankenstein's monster drowned in the previous movie is hanging out and is like, I want to see the monster's bones. I want to. I want to see the charred corpse for myself. I want to know justice has been done. And so he gar- he goes sneaking around and ends up falling into this you know watery pit under this windmill. And man, the reveal of the monster in this, of like you know his hand reaching out to grip this rock and like coming out of the shadows as you realize like oh you know, the monster, it, it turns out is alive. It's so good, man. Oh my God. This movie yep. is so beautiful. And with this being such an early sequel in Hollywood history, I was wondering, was that like the first, um, sequel montage recap ever? Like, I can't think of any before this. Probably. I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but yeah, I mean, just by virtue of it being, as early a film as it is yeah mm-hmm. i don't i don't know it was uh, yeah it, dracula didn't get one um in that second movie and and obviously there were some after this but before 1935 i can't really think of any other sequel montage recaps <laughs> yeah it but it, it it's really it's it's effective it catches it gets you up to speed mm-hmm. but it also just because whale directed both of these is great at setting the mood of like, oh, right, this is this very gothic tale that we are now sliding into. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, it's so good. But yeah, so the the monster reveals himself and then just strangles this father, like Hans, for his trouble of (laughs) wanting to see the bones ends up uh, getting himself murdered. And uh, meanwhile... uh, is it is it Uno O'Connor who's playing the the wife here? Uh, uh, she plays Minnie. Yes. Yeah, and so she's like, a, you know, Hans, Hans, get up here, and reaches down to as if to to get her husband out of the pit, mm-hmm. and instead brings up you know Karloff, <laughs> and gives a great like ah! a scream and runs off. And uh, uh, but the monster grabs her and throws her into the pit too. Oh, it's it, yeah, it, yeah. Some pretty brutal kills early on for Frank. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So you're right. Minnie, Minnie, and the wife are two separate characters. Minnie is Uno O'Connor. She's the one who screams and runs off because okay, yeah, yeah, because Whale loved the way that Uno O'Connor screamed. It was it, it yeah. tickled him to no end. He talked about it. All this the time. is uh, yeah. This is like her second or third Universal movie, isn't it? At this point. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know she was big in, um, Invisible Man as well. Yes. Because she plays the, the tavern, the, the wife of the tavern owner. And is basically playing the same character where she just runs around shrieking. (laughs) Uh, judging people poorly. Yeah. But again, that was (laughs) the thing that James Whale loved about her as a, as an actor was just like, oh, she can get hysterical better than anyone. And mm-hmm. uh, it it just pleased him to no end. So, um, <laughs> and oh, also they have found the body of Henry Frankenstein, who also did not die. 
and is taken back home and they they think he's dead at first but then his fiance um now uh, elizabeth discovers that he is in fact still alive alive <laughs> and uh many shows up and is like there's a monster and uh everybody ignores her they're like that monster's dead shut up Minnie. <laughs> but yeah so they're trying to basically nurse uh henry frankenstein back to health uh he's he's been weakened obviously by i don't know being hurled from a windmill and uh but henry also is like look i'm done with monsters i'm not making any more um and uh, he does say like if God has a plan, it may be that I am the one who is going to unlock the secrets of life and death. And Elizabeth is not pleased at all at, at this turn of events because she's like, once again, you are fucking with the <laughs> the natural order of things. And if you continue this, down this road, I foresee death. <laughs> and... That is where we are introduced to the real star of this movie, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> who is uh, Dr. Henry, uh, or uh, Dr. Septimus Pretorius is his name. Ah, such a great name. Oh, man. As played by <laughs> Ernest Thesiger. And this was originally supposed to be Claude Rain. And Bella Lugosi at one point. Yeah, and I think in both cases, they essentially just said like, "Hey, we're not, we don't want to get typecast in horror movies, so we're mm-hmm. gonna bow out of this." And I, as much as I love Claude Rains, and God knows I do, I really think this is the perfect actor for this role. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you. I mean. <sighs> Considering, you know, the cast of characters here and the fact that, you know, a lot of them are deplorable and just, you know, not the norm, you know, not the societal norm. I, I love the fact that they have an openly gay actor playing this character. Just just the whimsy that he adds to it, the, the energy even. Absolutely adore it. Uh, just such a great character. Yeah, and it's it's sort of the energy of that opening sequence because Pretorius as a character does not believe in bible stories as he puts it um has no reverence for any of that no reverence for you know sort of judeo-christian morality at all it is just he is a scientist you know he is he is the quintessential man scientist who just believes that there is knowledge out there we have to get it and if you break a few eggs along the way or make a few homunculi then so be it that's that's what you got to do mm-hmm and I, I really like this scene, especially Pretorius's performance, because you can kind of see some of the underlying homosexuality in this scene where he's he's literally verbally trying to get um, Henry back into the lab. And every time he looks over at Elizabeth, he has this sneer on his face that, you know, was probably a lot more prevalent in 35 than now, because I honestly didn't notice it the first few times I watched this movie. But on the last couple of watches, it's like, wow, he really hates Elizabeth and he's never even met her. So what does that mean? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think in some of the cut scenes or or certainly in the original script, the idea was that he was sort of uh, uh, an old professor of <laughs> Henry Frankenstein's. And, and there's some of that, but it, it really does come across like, oh, they're old colleagues, a.k.a they had a, a, like a fling or something back in the day <laughs> you know i mean he does he does have the line in the movie where you know we're no longer teacher and student now we can be colleagues yeah and i love the way that he <laughs> it's it's so weird for me to concentrate on one word in an entire line but his use of the word probe in that scene just comes off as so icky <laughs> i can't think of a better word than icky <laughs> he, he is wonderfully sinister yes and there the reason that he's such a great villain in this movie because he's way more of a villain than the monster is oh by far uh it's that 
he has, as you said, an open disregard for Elizabeth and this <laughs> relationship of Henry because he thinks it's beneath Henry. Like this is this is not the shit that they should be doing. They should be doing, you know, mad experiment stuff. And why are you wasting your time with this woman? when we could be changing like unlocking the secrets of the universe and you know perhaps having a couple of drinks along the way you know what yeah. i'm saying it, it is kind of funny how he wants henry to ignore his wife so that he can then go and create another wife yeah <laughs> not for him granted but it, it, it does seem kind of odd it's like eh, let me take you away from your wife for a little bit so that we can go and create this woman so that we can create a wife for somebody else it, it it's an odd argument, but, you know, obviously once the blackmail comes in, you know, it makes it more apparent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> once he starts blackmailing uh, uh, Frankenstein later. But, yeah, so he, he basically comes in and is like, Sue, I've heard that you're up to no good. Would you like to get up to no good together? And and Frankenstein <laughs> kind of throws him out. And, like, the, the the housemaid is glad of this. Like, she's she doesn't care for Pretoria as much. Elizabeth certainly doesn't, but yeah, Minnie doesn't seem like she likes anyone though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she is not uh, a friendly sort, um, and a little I... emotional. Yeah, yeah, I call her 1935 Miss Carmody. Very much so. Yeah, 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 <laughs> uh, for sure. And but eventually, Frankenstein, you know, keeps getting invitations from Pretorius to come to his lab. And and so he goes. He he goes to visit his his old teacher, and this is one of my favorite sequences in the movie mm -hmm. for sure. Where <laughs> Pretorius is like, you know, I haven't been uh, so successful in creating, you know, living things, full size living things from from dead bodies, but I've been doing some experiments of my own. Check this out, and brings out his, you know cavalcade of homunculi which are a queen a king who is real horny for the queen a pope or you know church head who is nodding off and sleeping again this movie likes to take a, a dig at religion everywhere it can mm -hmm. and and strangely like that stuff stayed in which is weird that this movie is so very clearly anti certainly organized religion but kind of anti-religion in general mm -hmm. um and that's not just the bad guy that's everybody in this movie <laughs> uh but yeah so there's that there's the mermaid there's uh the, uh the devil the devil <laughs> all right the king and queen mm-hmm and, um, and one that was supposed to be in there that we never actually got um, was Billy Barty, a yeah. uh, famous little person actor, you know, from Willow and Over the Rainbow. He was supposed to be one of the people in the jar, and they ended up cutting it for some reason. Yeah, the, the line that he had was something like, that Pretorius has is, we'll have to keep an eye on this one. He could grow up to be really something. <laughs> um, but there... The, the other thing that is <laughs> that goes down as they're kind of showing all the uh, Pretorius is showing all this off um, and really nice like film composite work here it looks really good for the time in which it was done this was all uh, uh, Fulton from Invisible Man kind of returning to do these mm -hmm. camera tricks and it looks great it's so good oh very effective absolutely i mean once you get past like kind of the comical aspect of it just to appreciate what you're looking at absolutely it looks great and uh you know pretorius basically is showing off like hey you know i'm yeah i am not uh at your level like i haven't you know whole cloth created a, a creature from dead body parts and, ha and and forced it to come to life but if you and I work together we could do anything and what I'm proposing is we make uh, a mate you know we, ma we, do, we make a woman forget about this making a man stuff let's make a woman and um, I can grow this artificial brain and you get the parts for the body 
and Frankenstein is like, absolutely not. Under no circumstances. This all sounds like crazy talk. This is how I got into trouble the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and so he kind of fucks off, leaving Pretorius to his own devices. Yeah, by far. I've, I've never looked at Henry as an antagonist here. For my money, Dr. Pretorius is the antagonist. It's not Frank and it's not the monster. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, he is the one that's forcing all of the action of the movie. Mm-hmm. And and then, so we get to uh, our first kind of time with the monster outside of the pit where... Um, he's off in the woods he you know has some water from this standing pool and sees his reflection and gives it up you know uh (laughs) hates hates the the very sight of himself yeah and i can i can relate to that (laughs) yeah i mean well yeah like you said there are we are uh, of a type where, yeah, you know, the reason that you relate to these creatures, especially Frankenstein's monster, and especially in this movie, mm-hmm. is that he's just a, he's just someone who desperately wants to be accepted by anybody. And yeah, I mean, honestly, you you could make an argument that the theme of this whole movie is acceptance. I mean, he's looking for you know friendship, companionship love even but ultimately acceptance the fact that no one accepts him here except for one hermit and you know that goes to shit too so yeah yeah it's it's an incredibly sad story yeah and so there's uh this shepherdess girl who you know sees him uh, or she falls into the water and and is drowning and he saves her and then as soon as she wakes up she screams and uh, two hunters come and, you know, are taking shots at the monster and he uh, runs off the, you know, and, and this leads to a bunch of villagers uh, chasing after him. And actually, one of my absolute favorite shots of this movie is the monster, like on the the, the rise of this hill, as you see mm-hmm. this line of villagers just circling it and coming up the path. <laughs> it's oh. Jesus allegory, anyone? <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, yes. And in fact, because this is all done on a set and so forth, like the the forest that they're in is all, um, you know, these standing trees that have no real branches or anything. It's just <laughs> a bunch of poles. And sure enough, they absolutely uh, tie Frankenstein to a pole, like the Christ imagery comes yeah incredibly thick here yeah Mm -hmm. and they haul him off to a dungeon they chain him to this chair and you know leave him to suffer in in a cell that looks like this just german expressionist nightmare with these crazy high walls in this window that is is set way high up where all the villagers are looking down on him and uh, you know t- doing everything but throwing rotten tomatoes at him and stuff like that. <laughs> it's so good. And but the monster of course breaks out, uh busts out the chair, busts out the the cell, runs off uh into the night and is lured into another home. Um by the sound of a violin playing Ave Maria. Mm -hmm. And in a scene, I I think I had seen Young Frankenstein (laughs) before I saw Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, That might be the same for me as well, actually. (laughs) Because I remember the, like seeing Bride of Frankenstein and and thinking like, Oh, it's like that scene from Young Frankenstein. (laughs) And, but it is that it is the you know Gene Hackman as the old blind uh, hermit, and uh, but yeah, so he's just this guy living alone, you know, getting by, and because he can't see the monster, he can accept him, hmm. and so you know all he knows is that there's this big mute guy in his house who needs food and wine and helps him by the fire and teaches him how to smoke and you know. 
Yeah, th th this is the kind of scene that proves how cynical a human being I am because unconditional kindness is so strange to me. Like that that's the thing that doesn't make sense to me. Like I like I can accept Frankenstein more than I can accept unconditional kindness, especially in this world in 2022, like most of us would probably think this old guy wants something. Why is he being so nice? Why is he feeding us, giving us wine, blah blah blah, you know? Um so it, it struck me as very I mean this scene is very powerful to me for two reasons. One, the unconditional kindness, and then two, the fact that Frank actually cries here. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was, I was actually moved by how um, powerful that scene was on this most recent watch. I've always loved that whole scene, you know, with the hermit. But something about watching it this time, and you know, and with all the tragedies in the world, all the school shootings and pandemics, and all the hate that's out there. Um, to see unconditional kindness, just I, it's it felt so odd to me, and it says something about me. Like I, I learned something about myself watching this film this time around. I don't know that I could accept unconditional kindness, and that's probably a pretty messed up thing. <laughs> You're probably right, and but I think for <laughs> the monster here, because he's never had it, and it's mm -hmm. all he wants is just for someone to show him even a little bit of kindness like even him murdering the little girl in uh the first film is really just this you know of mice and men kind of thing mm -hmm. where he's trying to have a friend and that's where uh the the hermit comes in and teaches him the words of you know here here's friend and yes and no and good and bad and bread and drink and you know that fire isn't always bad and you know uh mm -hmm. that kind of thing and the fire of course being a bit of a metaphor i think for humanity at large in this movie that you know as the the hermit tells him like no 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 it it can be good like we're we're if you harness it and use it it's good and and like you said you know the the monster rolls a tear here like he is finally you know, with a friend, he keeps grabbing the guy's hand and shaking him. Friend, friend, <laughs> and it's wonderful. It's so good. Yeah. And unfortunately, though, this can't possibly last because, uh, you know, the monster is again our Christ figure, and <laughs> uh, he cannot be happy. So he ends up, uh, like hanging out with the hermit until a couple of hunters show up one of whom by the way john carradine yeah <laughs> and uh and they show up and they're like hey that's the monster we've been looking for and he you know goes on the attack and they're accidentally uh burns down this cottage as the hunters kind of get free with the hermit and and so forth so no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah, yeah, poor guy, yet again. And so the the monster ends up in a crypt, hiding in in a in a crypt. And sure enough, there is Pretorius, um, who is down there to you know grab some raw materials for his experiments with uh, <laughs> Carl, as played by Dwight Fry. Always mm -hmm. happy to see him. And uh, yeah. another guy named Ludwig. Um, but yeah, so they're breaking into a grave. And I really like... After they leave, Pretorius just hangs out to like have dinner in this crypt. <laughs> I think he was getting high. He was probably just smoking a joint. <laughs> well, he said... Earlier in the movie when he's talking, he offers uh, Frankenstein a drink. Uh, the The doctor... Mm -hmm. and he his says, only weakness my only weakness <laughs> and when the the monster finds him in the crypt he offers him uh, a cigarette or the, or the monster sees a, uh, a smoke and is like ah, good and he's like oh would you like a smoke well it's my only weakness I, I have that in my notes how many only weaknesses does he have hmm. it's, a, it's a real <laughs> joker move of yeah. you know let me tell you how I got these scars you know, yeah, it's, oh, big time. <laughs> it's totally that. Like that is, that is the wild Carpertorius is in this movie. It's oh, it's so yeah. good. 
Yeah, I mean, this this movie has probably some of the most prolific comedy of the original, you know, universal horror films. Like, I, I to this day, after dozens of viewings, I still chuckle multiple times throughout the film. I mean, it's legitimately funny. Obviously, Minnie is kind of funny as the, you know, the silly old lady who's scared of everything. But Pretorius brings some great comedy in here. Um, what was his name? The guy who played Fritz in the original movie, Dwight Fry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brings bring some great comedy here. I mean, yeah, th- this this movie is legit funny. I think a lot of people don't give it credit for that, but it, it is damn funny. <laughs> I really like when you first see Carl. Uh, maybe not the first time, but it's one of the the early appearances of this character. It's it's in that scene where you know all the villagers are going to uh, tie the monster to the pole at the top of the mm-hmm. hill, and he's just hanging out leaning against a tree having a smoke (laughs) and he just looks like the biggest dirtbag in the world it's wonderful it and he's and dwight fry who is a tremendous actor like his renfield is maybe my favorite renfield apart uh, i'm a big tom waits renfield fan but uh but he's dwight fry is right there it's you catch me on the right day and either (laughs) one could be my favorite but you know, he's just got such a a, a screen presence that you're kind of drawn to him. He's a wonderful character actor, and uh, and he and he's terrific in this as well. Even though he's got a very small part. Yep. But yeah, so the the monster shows up, and and Pretorius gives him, you know, wine to drink, and gives him a cigarette, and he's like, you know, um, I've got a plan to get you a friend. Wouldn't you like a friend? And the monster's like, eh, friend, good. He's like, great, great. How about you come back with me? And I think that my bargaining power is going to uh, be well endowed at this point now that mm-hmm. I've got you to to help make this argument. <laughs> and so he finally goes to, to visit Henry again, now with, you know, the, the monster. And... Uh, he kind of keeps him at the back. It's a real nice move where he's like, you know, uh, I know that you're getting married to this woman and all, but how about we make that woman that we were talking about? And, you know, Frankenstein's like, absolutely not. Never. He's like, oh, (laughs) really? Uh, Hey, uh, how about you come on in here? And in comes the monster. And he's like, your help, friend. And he tells the monster to go out but kind of gives up the you know the rub of the nose to let him know that it's time to get down (laughs) and so the monster ends up capturing or kidnapping elizabeth and takes her off and pretorius tells him like look i'll give you your stupid wife back she's gonna be fine but i'm only gonna do that once that we have completed our work and so that's that's how you convince Dr. Henry Frankenstein to go back into the lab is to kidnap his fiance. But it turns out that once you get him there, he kind of forgets all about her. Uh, <laughs> which is one of the things I really love is that you see that kind of madness overtake him again. Mm-hmm. Where he's like, oh, yeah, no, you know, th- this is all going so well. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they build the titular Bride of Frankenstein in Pretorius's lab. And we get the scene that, you know, everyone thinks of when they think about these Frankenstein movies of, Mm -hmm. you know, here's the platform, a storm raging overhead and people throwing levers and raising the platforms up and all that stuff. Was I the only one who thought those kites would never fly in a million years? <laughs> they didn't look functional. <laughs> you know, those old style box kites and stuff yeah. are just like, I don't know. This is the like the old airplane kind of design exactly. where it's like, we're just going to go so fast that we have to get gain altitude. But this all seems like a terrible, terrible idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Benjamin Franklin at work. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Uh, it's yeah. This all seems real half-ass. But 
<laughs> sure enough, the the lightning strikes and things glow and all that stuff, and they bring the platform back down, and we get sort of a, a repeat of the line from the original Frankenstein. Only the gender is is swapped here, where uh, instead of saying he's alive, uh, Doctor Frankenstein yells out, "She's alive! Alive!" Yeah, we only get two alives in this one. Got like five or six in the original. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's a it well new when to <laughs> pull it back. It's like, hey, you just need a couple of these. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, and so after, you know, Elsa Lancaster as the bride comes to life, they start removing her bandages. Um, a little note here that I really like is that uh, because they had her wrapped up like a mummy, which was sort of the stage direction is like she ought to be bandaged like a mummy that when they were shooting these scenes, she couldn't move. And so <laughs> when they broke for lunch and stuff, people would have to carry her to <laughs> the lunch area and feed her and everything. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people were complaining. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll carry El Elsa Lanchester around the set for free. Just call me. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, Boris Karloff, poor guy, is this old man wearing this crazy amount of prosthetics and, yeah. you know, uh. like his arthritis is killing him. And like in between scenes, he's just laying down on a bench somewhere to try to get a, a moment's peace. Um, no wonder he didn't want to go back and do this, but. Nope. I don't uh, blame him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so, speaking of Boris Karloff, the, the monster enters now because, hey, he, the mate has been created, so it's time, you know, for him to kind of claim his prize, which is, is this woman uh, that has been created specifically for him. Um, and I guess it's probably worth talking about the look of the Bride of Frankenstein, which is entirely iconic at this point. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely not as messed up as Frank, uh, you know, as our original monster. I mean, honestly, the only thing, other than the crazy hairdo, the only thing that really sets her apart from a normal human is just that giant scar under her neck, you know? So, uh, obviously, Pretorius is maybe um, improving on Henry Frankenstein's original, you know, notes and experiments and everything, hence why he can make one that doesn't need bolts on the side of her neck or doesn't, um, you know, doesn't lumber around as much. I mean, it, it seemed like she was cognitive, like, way faster than Frank in the original movie. I mean, she, she was already up, looking around, screaming. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's really good. Uh, hissing, of course. Oh, the beautiful, oh, the classic hissing. I love that hiss so much. Especially the context of it, you know, like what's happening around. Oh, love it. I, and I love the way that her head kind of jerks around. It's a really, you know... It's almost robotic. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it's so good. And anyway, so yeah, uh, Frank, the Frankenstein's monster comes in is like, you know, friend, friend. And she's like, bull to the shit. <laughs> and <it laughs> is clearly as horrified by the monster as any of the townspeople were. Mm -hmm. And so Frankenstein says, she hate me like others. And you didn't give her enough time, buddy. <laughs> yeah, like they, they tried to do this sit down of like, hey, you know, have a seat with me on this bench and I'm going to take your hand and she gives him the hiss again and, and mm -hmm. scrambles away. And so th at that point, the monster is like, well, I'm ready to burn it all down then. You know, it's a real, <laughs> like, we're all going to hell tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it, once again, this is a scene that really struck me harder on this watch, especially, you know, with the amount of celebrities and, and in my case, personal friends that have taken their own life over the years. Um, the fact that Frank is, you know, basically a jilted lover. You know, he, he's been waiting all this time for his mate to be created. Finally, she's created and she wants nothing to do with him. So what's his answer? I'm just going to kill myself and take you all with me. It very, it, it's a very modern take on this. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sure James Whale didn't really intend it to be taken like this. But obviously in 2022, you can't really ignore the parallels. Well, 
I mean, you're right. And there's also the element of, like, uh, Elizabeth gets free and is banging on the door. Um, <laughs> by the way, one of my favorite things about this movie, one of the things that they wanted to do and it got changed, and I, I think it got changed at the script level before the movie was ever shot, but uh, there's a whole thing about, like, we have to get a heart to, you know, for this creature to live. And originally it was intended that they were going to get Elizabeth's heart. That while she was, you know, being held, held captive, that they were just going to kill her, take her heart, because it needed to be fresh. And, you know, it, enhancing the tragedy of the movie even more. Which, of all the things that they changed and removed and that kind of thing, that's the one I'm like... That would have been pretty badass. Uh, a little bit, yeah. It does. It, it does. I don't know if 1935 audiences could could have handled that, but I, I, at the same time, it would have been great. Yeah, and I think that's probably why they removed it. It's just like you have got to be shitting me. Like, no, <laughs> we've already had you. You know, cut the body count in half. We are not going to have you have the this monster carve out the heart of the fiance. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so, but she shows up. Elizabeth shows up and is banging on the door. And uh, Henry Frankenstein is going to send her away. And Frank, the monster, says, no, go, you live. Uh, basically sending Frankenstein and Elizabeth out to live a life. I like that Frank had the wherewithal to know that, that, um, excuse me. I like that the monster had the wherewithal to know that Henry wasn't the villain. Henry, even though Henry created him, he didn't create him for a malicious purpose. And what was, and, and the fact that he recognizes that it was more Pretorius, um, wanting to create the bride and, you know, why everything kind of went to shit, if you will. Um, I, I love that, you know, I mean, cause at this point, how long has Frank even existed? you know, total, you know, between the two movies, probably not very long. And the fact that he still does have the mental capacity to understand and Henry doesn't hate you. Henry doesn't want to destroy you. And Henry doesn't necessarily want to continue creating, you know, dead living people. So uh, I, I just like that. I, I, it it kind of humanizes Frank a little bit. I like it. Well, and there's, there's the additional element too of this is what the monster craves which is here is this woman that is is madly in love with her husband is just trying to get to him to get him to safety to live a life together and so i think there's an element of the you know the monster sort of recognizing that too of like i'm i'm going to kind of give my creator this gift of love mm -hmm. and what that i that has been robbed from me and but yeah pretorius uh is told like you stay <laughs> like no 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 <laughs> you're not going anywhere i like that it's oh it's real good and then Henry i even like the di I, I like the dichotomy a little bit I mean, dichotomy might be the wrong word but i love how frank or excuse me how henry and pretorius are trying to create a human being uh they do it somewhat successfully but obviously there's there's repercussions and then Frank, like you said, not only gives him the gift of life, but gives him the gift to go and create life the more traditional way, which is probably what Henry wants at this point. He probably wants nothing to do with dead body parts anymore. Now he goes to, you know, he goes and gets to, you know, create a human, uh, the more fun way, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and we'll, we'll circle back to Son of Frankenstein one of these days. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that is, that's the movie that is the result of this scene. Um, but yeah, so mm -hmm. this is the, the, the famous line where, um, the monster says, we belong dead and pulls the, a lever on the wall, the, the magic lever that blows up everything apparently. And yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe next time don't make yourself destruct switch a simple lever. <laughs> right, you know, and like there, there's that great moment when Henry Frankenstein is like, "No, not that lever." Uh, <laughs> also, speaking uh, of of Colin Clive as Henry Frankenstein and and young Frankenstein, hmm. there is such a a direct ripoff that Gene uh, Gene Wilder does of Colin yeah. Clive when 
Elizabeth first comes into the laboratory, um, Colin Clive goes, Beck, get Beck! <laughs> and Gene Wilder does that same riff at one point in Young Frankenstein, mm-hmm. and it pleases me to no end in both <laughs> movies. I love I love the pronunciation of Beck! <laughs> It, oh, I love it so much. Um, anyway, but yeah, so We Belong Dead pulls the lever, everything explodes. And it, there's a really good miniature effect of this tower just crumbling. Mm-hmm. It's it's quite good. A great one, actually. Much better looking than the windmill. Yeah, for but, sure. And yeah. yeah, so, you know, Frankenstein's monster rolls his last tear of the movie as he destroys himself uh the the bride and um pretorius Mm -hmm. and and announces by the way the thing i find interesting about the we belong deadline is yes that is aimed uh, at at the bride but also pretorius like he is passing judgment he's playing judge jury and executioner with pretorius here as well uh (laughs) which i like uh, because I don't think it's like the, the the fact that it's not just him saying, "Hey, the, you know, the two of us that came from dead parts, we belong dead." It's also him saying, "Like you two, because you're just a son of a bitch. Like you had me kidnapping people, you made this woman that hates me. Like you're going down with the rest of us." And <laughs> I find that really interesting. I. I I think as a kid, I always associated the We Belong Dead with just the monster and the bride, but that's not really the case in this movie. Um, mm-hmm. But that's it. And then, you know, roll credits on Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah, a little abrupt for me. I would have liked to have seen just a little tiny bit of an epitaph. Nothing major. I mean, just something with Henry and Elizabeth. Um, or go back to the intro. Go back yeah. to the Shelleys and Lord Byron. That would have been awesome. Yeah, the bookend had apparently not been invented yet uh, in cinema. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It would have been great to have a moment with, with like, Byron saying, like, well, that's even more terrible than the story you told. You know, something <laughs> like you that. Go. Uh, but, but yeah, I, you know, if you're going to, you know, cite a flaw of this movie, I suppose it's just that it ends the way that all movies of this era did, which is story's done. Everybody go home. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've seen much worse examples of this, but yeah, actually from this same year, 1935, Mad Love starring Peter Lorre. Mm. It's even more abrupt than this one. Literally the bad guy gets shot and boom credits. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you're right. That was definitely more common in the 30s and 40s. Right. It's you know, hey, we had we had things to do. Like we're you know this. <laughs> mo- you wait. You wait in your chair for 30 minutes. The movie's gonna roll around again because you know you got a serial, a cartoon, and then some news, and then the movie's yep. uh, coming back. Um, <laughs> all right. Let Let's talk about this cast. Holy shit, this cast. Yeah. Um, we've talked a, a bit about Karloff, who. Um, looks a little different in this because he, he's got his teeth in, <laughs> uh, you know, it was also older and all that stuff, but yeah, he, it, because he had to do more speaking in this, um, he had to wear his false teeth, which pushed out his, his cheek some, mm-hmm. and, um, he's like, I, I, I know it's a cliche to say it, but he is so good in this movie at, at doing so much with so little, um, yes, it's absolutely. all, it's all expression. It's all grunts. And, but the, like, he has got one of the most expressive faces, um, in, in early Hollywood, you know, he's amazing in this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So, and then Colin Clive, as I said, Colin Clive, by the way, big drinking problem during the course of this movie mm-hmm. and is is a little the worse for the wear but i still think he's he's great in it and as i said i will listen to colin clive say get back um <laughs> anytime he plays it off well i mean because because throughout a lot of the movie he's very uncomfortable he's very put out so the fact that you know maybe he was also dealing with a little bit of alcoholism 
may have actually enhanced the role a little bit. Maybe. I'm not sure. But I, I, I think it worked out well because, like I said, he's kind of – he's on edge the whole movie. It's not like he's really comfortable at any point until the very end when he's hugging Elizabeth. So, you know, maybe that alcoholism added to that performance, you know, the uncomfortable feel of it. Yeah. Um, and we, we talked about Uno O'Connor as many. She's always a delight. Um, and Elsa Lanchester as, you know, Mary Shelley and the Bride. Uh, terrific. <laughs> just terrific like oh uh, amazing like uh, such a strangely like powerful female character at the beginning of this movie Mm -hmm. you know for being the focus and it's not because she's somebody's boy or somebody's girlfriend it's she is the creator of frankenstein and and this is fully acknowledged and everybody is at the edge of their seat to hear what she's gonna say and it it feels strangely progressive uh, for this movie, even though, you know, she becomes a bride who is ultimately murdered by the monster. But, you know, the, the character of Mary Shelley in this movie is is kind of interestingly powerful uh, and is godlike in her own right. You know, as as Pretorius himself says, you know, an age of gods and monsters. And... Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I have no idea what Mary Shelley was like in life, but Elsa as Mary Shelley just exuded this confidence almost arrogant confidence where she barely looks up from her knitting when lord byron makes a comment she'll smile but she you know she she doesn't necessarily stop everything she's doing to acknowledge him that 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 level of confidence obviously you know she's already written one of the greatest novels of all time at this point and lord byron is sitting there basically you know stroking her ego for it Mm -hmm. uh, for good reason mind you but yeah, the, so the, her smile in that scene, it's that smile of a confident woman that has a lot going on behind her eyes. I like it. Yeah, it's a real Dorothy Parker kind of vibe almost. Ooh, yes, thank you. Uh, all right, and then the real star of this movie, Ernest the, uh, the- Thesiger as Dr. <laughs> Septimus Pretorius. Maybe uh. my favorite performance in any universal horror movie of this era i can't disagree honestly i mean no no other performance really i mean obviously bela as dracula in the original that movie was that movie and role was made for him i mean bela is about the only reason that the original movie is even worth watching uh you know i'm sure that'll be discussed on some podcasts here and there Uh, um and twice as renfield oh yeah Oh, do we, uh, yeah, getting getting to see him back, absolutely. Love it, love it. Um, I, lo- I love them in the original as Fritz, as our Igor character, if you will. And, um, yeah, even though we didn't get a lot of them here, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more. Uh, what what little we get is still very entertaining. <laughs> yeah, I, oh my God. I I feel like the, the Pretorius character is, it, it's one of those things that feels like, almost the the whale surrogate in this movie that it's james whale you know projecting himself into the movie to an extent because he's always like on the verge of a grin but you know he's up to no good he's just having a blast both both actor and character in this movie are just having a grand time with their shenanigans it it's just the best oh my god i love it so much <laughs> um all right well let, let's, did you notice yeah oh go ahead no 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 i was gonna bring up the makeup um did you notice how frank's makeup was kind of evolving as the movie went along there was actually four stages of uh frankenstein's uh makeup used throughout the film you know because obviously you know he's soaking wet at the beginning but if you if you look really closely, his his flesh is actually somewhat deteriorating throughout the film. If the film were in color, it would have been a lot more obvious, um, mm-hmm. according to what James Whale said. But yeah, there are four different stages of Frank's makeup. So yeah, next time you watch it, look real careful. You'll see the different stages and how he's kind of getting worse for wear as the movie goes along. Yeah, Jack Pierce, who obviously did the original Frankenstein makeup as well as this. Uh, but yeah, he he very much wanted to kind of portray, oh, well, mm-hmm. you know, he was in this fire, so now his face is all burned, and so is his arm. And 
Uh, yep. All that stuff is really good. <laughs> there was, I, was it Elsa Lanchester, I think, who was talking about Jack Pierce, about how much she disliked him? Oh, it hated, I think, is the word. <laughs> yeah. I loved it. <laughs> where, where she said that he would come in in the mornings, he would come into the room, uh, the, the makeup room, and um, I, the way she put it was like, he seemed like he thought he was making, you know, people of his own. <laughs> and would wear like a doctor's lab coat and she he said that if you if you said good morning to him first then he would get pissed off at you like he would kind of sneer at you that he wanted to come in and good morning how is everyone like he wanted to be in charge of everything mm -hmm. and yeah she she did not care for Jack Pierce much at all yeah, yeah. If you watch a lot of Universal movies with special features, Jack Pierce was not a beloved person on the set of a lot of these Universal movies. Yeah. Boris had an issue with them early on. I think they worked out their differences for a bride, but yeah, for the first Frankenstein movie, I know there was a lot of back and forth between those two. I've heard stories of Jack purposely kind of trolling his actors and maybe taking longer to do the makeup than it actually needed because maybe he didn't like them very much. I mean... Jack Pierce is a brilliant makeup artist, but he sounds like an absolute asshole. <laughs> yeah, Lon Chaney Jr. hated him. Yep, yep. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was brilliant, as you yep. said, but just, just seemed like a real monster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so let, let's get into the, the real meat of this and talk about some of the themes of the film which we we've touched on a little bit but mm -hmm. i'm gonna shut up i just want to hear you talk about what you get out of bride of frankenstein because i love hearing you talk about movies well i mean i think first and foremost the queer theory is always going to be a big part of this uh you know whether intentional or unintentional you know whether perceived or actually in there you know put in there by james whale um, it's hard to ignore, you know, back, back in 35 and now in 2022, it's, it's, it's really hard to ignore that aspect of it. When you really, you know, I, I talked earlier about the scene where Pretorius and Henry first meet, uh, you know, when you go back and watch that scene, really look at Pretorius's face. I mean, there's almost a lust there. And the question is, is it a lust for Henry or a lust for knowledge or both? <laughs> you know, so that's the obvious allegory, um, the, the obvious kind of uh, theme of the movie. But then there's another one that I hadn't really thought about. And I have a quote here that I'm going to read. This quote is by Jane uh, Blagett. Blagett. Uh, she is an associate dean at the University of Northern Colorado. She actually wrote a dissertation on the Bride of Frankenstein a few years ago. And I'm just going to quote one line from her book that really hit me hard when I hit when I read it the first time. One of the themes of Bride of Frankenstein is the male envy of the power of woman to bring life forth and a male fantasy that he should be able to do the same. That is so fucking heavy. The fact that the only, I mean, the only thing that, you know, in general, obviously I'm generalizing here, but the only thing that a man could be jealous of a woman for is the fact that she creates life. She actually bears forth the fruit of, you know, men's sexual labors, if you will. Mm -hmm. And to hear um, this uh, associate dean talk about that, because it, it never even crossed my mind, like toxic masculinity or... Um, uh, some sort of male jealousy, uh, you know, of womanhood never struck me. But after I read this quote the first time, which was probably probably about a year ago, right before I bought the Frankenstein Universal box set, mm -hmm. which I actually bought for Abbott and Costello meet the Frankenstein because it's the only way you can get it. You can't buy it by itself. Is but it that's really? another story. Okay. Uh, um, right. At least at least a year ago it was. I'm not sure if maybe it's gotten a release or whatever, but. Um, I didn't actually look for DVD. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a, a, a physical media guy, but I want the highest quality possible. Sure. Yeah. Blu-ray or bust. Uh, I, I'm exactly. With you. And I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't find uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, which is actually a favorite of my wife and I, uh, Mrs. Venom actually loves that movie. Um, she likes Abbott and Costello in general, but yeah, that was the only way I could get the damn movie on Blu-ray was to buy the box set. Mind you, I'm not complaining because my favorite universal horror movie ever is on the box set. So I'm very okay with that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, like I said, after I read this quote, I really, really started to 
look at the movie a little bit differently. And and this Dean is kind of correct. Like, especially with the Pretorius character. Like, Pretorius seems legitimately upset that he can't create life the way a woman can, to the point that he created the little people in the jar, but still wasn't happy. I mean, most people who create life out of nothing would be ecstatic. But Pretorius, no, he, he's that, that 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 wasn't his goal. His goal wasn't to make little jar people. It was to make full size humans uh, from nothing, not necessarily from dead bodies like Henry did. But and the more I watch it, and the more I see Pretorius's kind of psychosis come through, I I do see that. I see a lot, even to the point where he names. Um, uh, Elsa, the bride of Frankenstein, like you know that 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 it, in and of itself is slightly pretentious. Like what she's going to just instantly fall in love with Frank, like she has no say in the matter. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I mind you, folks, I just watched A 24s Men uh, came out in theaters this weekend, and yeah, there's a lot on my mind about toxic masculinity right now. Oh, it's so a terrific it's, movie. Oh, a spectacular movie. Yeah. I absolutely adore that ending. A lot of people don't understand what that ending is, and I'm not even 100% sure that I understand it, but my take on it is I, I fucking love it. I yeah. think that movie was great. But I was, so, yeah. <laughs> not, not to derail the conversation about, uh, no, no. turn it to about men, but I, I think you're right. I, th- I think there was a lot of crossover here. Um, a hundred mm-hmm. years later, you know, there's, uh, there, there was something to be said. The, uh, for James Well, kind of commenting on some of the same stuff, uh, but the the thing about men that really surprised me was how shocking that last twenty minutes are. Mm-hmm. You know, like like genuinely, some of the most it, it's it's a, a a phrase that gets overused, but it's it's Cronenbergian in a oh, yes. in a way that most movies aren't like. Every now and again, somebody will throw that around and you're like, ah, I guess I see a little bit of this. Like, you know, uh, even even something like Possessor is like, well, yeah, it's there is an element of Cronenberg in that. But holy God. The- yeah, that that final, you know, 10, 15 minutes, I was not something I was expecting from this movie. I, I don't generally watch trailers. Most people who listen to me know that. But I did go back and watch the trailer after watching the movie. And that was actually a great trailer. Like, they really hid the the kind of, I don't want to say Lovecraftian, mm-hmm. um, but like you said, Cronenbergian, you know, kind of elements of it. Because, I mean, you don't expect body horror when you see the trailer for this movie, you yeah. know, there, there's nothing about the story that would imply there, there might be some body horror, but then we get, yeah, a good five to 10 minutes of some of the best body horror of the year. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it was I, like I said, just shocked and stunned by it, you know, in the best possible way. And better so. yet, I, I was watching this movie with a bunch of normies <laughs> and hearing people at the end of that movie being like, what in the fuck was that? <laughs> just, <laughs> beside themselves oh it was so good um well anyway anyway back 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 to uh bride of frankenstein but um yeah so i i i totally agree i think there is this element of like this latent homosexuality the 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 idea of this being kind of a jealous male gaze is is really fascinating um And then, like I mentioned earlier, the themes of acceptance and companionship throughout, you know, Frank basically just looking for acceptance in this cruel world. And even when he finds the little tiny piece of kindness, it gets taken away from him. Um, I mean, again, that could be an allegory for a lot of our lives. I mean, all we're looking for is is acceptance, happiness, companionship, love. Um, And to watch Frank get denied all of those things just because he looks different. It's a very powerful statement. Yeah, there, there's also a heady blend of the, uh, uh, you know, an irreverence or a, a, a sort of a disposability when it comes to religion. That, mm-hmm. like, science in the face of religion. And you can, I suppose, make the argument that by the end of the movie, you know, uh, Henry Frankenstein is kind of running back into the arms of the more normal uh, mm-hmm. kind of Judeo-Christian structure when he goes back to uh elizabeth but you know he's not terribly complimentary and even whale using this sort of christ imagery with the monster of like 
you're using Christ imagery with something that's man-made. <laughs> and I, I don't think that's lost on James Whale of like, oh, then, you know, <laughs> Jesus, or at least the divinity of Jesus, as, as Whale sees it, is a man-made construction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so, uh, again, this movie is just filled with stuff like that. It's 75 minutes long, and you could do an essay on about five different oh, yeah. things. I mean, I've read 500 page essays on this movie. I yeah. mean, and and the author was like, I could write another 500 easily. Yeah, it's <laughs> it, it's just so dense with all of this stuff. It's so good. Um, but I, all right, let's hmm, let, kind of wrap this up with uh, final thoughts and and our score. Obviously. We only do uh, five stars here uh, is, is the top of the list. We allow half stars, no quarter stars, because unlike the subject of this movie, we are not monsters here. <laughs> I mean, what can I say about this movie? From top to bottom, this movie is damn near a, pa a masterpiece. From Franz Waxman's amazing score, John Meskell's cinematography, you know, w w that we're all familiar with from the Frankenstein movies and other Universal movies. But first and foremost, the art direction of this film by Charles D. Hall. Mm. Wow. This art direct and these miniatures are gorgeous. The sets are beautiful. Yeah, I know it's 1935, and you know the, the the ones that are the sets that are inside of a sound studio are very obviously inside of a studio, um, or you know a shooting studio. But it, it's still for 1935. It, it's it's a gorgeous film, masterfully made all around, in front and behind the camera. What other score could I possibly give this film? But five out of five. Yeah, yeah. It the thing that I I keep coming back to watching these movies and also talking about them in a way that you know you, you hope people are are listening to and responding to, and it I almost feel like I, I'm you know just banging the same drum, but it I don't feel like you have to qualify these movies of like well it's good for the time, you know. Bride of Frankenstein is a good movie right now today. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like if somebody put this out, if Robert Eggers released The Bride of Frankenstein, you would be like, <laughs> my God, that guy is a genius. It's valid. Absolutely. There are very few timeless movies in this world. And despite this being in black and white and, you know, maybe not looking like the most modern film it, it, it is timeless in my both in its themes in its performances in its filmmaking it is you know just an, an incredible piece of work i you know I, I can't look at it as anything but a perfect film i mean i i almost have nothing negative to say about it in fact i don't think i have other than the very abrupt ending which is meh since since it was kind of a common thing back in the 30s i i can accept it i can forgive it but for that to be like my only issue with the movie yeah it's it's pretty much perfect yeah, it, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. It's a it's a five star film for sure. Um, if you've never seen The Bride of Frankenstein, it, you have to. I like it's it's one of those things that is essential to the vocabulary of horror films. Um, I mean, yeah, we haven't actually said it in so many words, but I'll say it right now. This is one of the greatest sequels ever made. One of the first great sequels, and to this day, easily in my top five greatest, not just horror sequels, but sequels yeah. of all time. I, I, I mean, it's that, better than the original, with, for sure. It yeah. is much better than the original. Yeah. I mean, it's not even close. I love the original, don't get me wrong. Sure. It's still a great movie, um, some wonderful subtext throughout, but... This movie is just head and shoulders above the original. And to think James Whale didn't want to make this. And to think that in some multiverse somewhere, James Whale didn't make this movie. Ah, oh, that's depressing. So I am so glad I live in a world where Bride of Frankenstein exists. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I can't. You're right. It, it would be one thing if whale like they, they had a bunch of other directors on deck i like because as soon as frankenstein came out and as soon as test screenings of the movie happened there were people already being lined up to do a sequel mm -hmm. and uh so the fact that he came back and came back and did such a weird different movie because you could just remake 
you know, like Son of Frankenstein is really just Frankenstein, and you know, yeah. But mm-hmm. but Whale just was like, hey, let's have some fun with this, and does, and it's incredible. It's oh, it's so good. Um, but yeah, it's a five star yeah. film. Yeah, I mean, this is why I say this movie is so much more than a horror film. You know, people will tag it as a universal horror classic, which it absolutely is. But the more I watch this film, the less horror I actually see in it. Pretorius is basically the nature of the horror in this movie. And and even then, it comes off as slightly comical because of just, you know, the way the character delivers his lines and carries himself and things. So, yeah. And to think how dark this movie could have been. You mentioned earlier a lot of scenes that were, you know, that were supposed to be filmed that either weren't or were cut, you know, with Frankenstein's violence. There was one scene that was never filmed that I I kind of would have liked to have seen. Basically, it was a subplot with Carl, the uh, the Igor character, if you will, in this movie. Uh, basically, there was going to be a subplot where he actually kills his own uncle and aunt his own aunt and uncle to give the bodies to Dr. Pretorius to experiment on. And it was, it was supposed to be a pretty violent scene, which is probably why they never even filmed it. (laughs) I mean, considering a lot of the scenes they did film and ended up getting cut anyway, I I still would have liked to have seen that scene, of course, just to see more of Dwight Fry. I mean, you know, there there is an ulterior motive there, but I would have liked to have seen what James Whale actually did with like a legit murder scene, like, you know, human on human violence, you know, no Frankenstein, no monster. Um, but uh, I mean, the, the, the movie doesn't suffer because of it. It's not like it suffers because of the lack of that scene. It's just one of those scenes that was never shot that I kind of would have liked to have seen, especially James Whale's style with it. That would have been interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Robert Eggers earlier. I, I could have come off. Very much like a Robert Eggers horror film, so who knows? I mean, truly, whether it's you know, one of the things that James Whale did, and also the in, in the production design, it's everything is gray. I mean, obviously, it's a black and white movie, but like the sky is always overcast. <laughs> uh, if it's not outright, you know, storming, the trees are always stark. Like everything is. is grim and oppressive and you know i i think it's on the the commentary track for this that i was listening to but um one of the the film scholars said there is just not a frame of this movie that is not on purpose Mm -hmm. and and that's the thing i mean that's why i the eggers now that i've said that i think the james whale robert eggers comparison is pretty apt uh, oh yeah, because they're they're just both filmmakers that don't make mistakes. What what you are seeing on screen is what they wanted you to see, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's why James Whale is one of the best directors of the of that or any era. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put him up there with uh, Hitchcock and any of the new modern masters of horror any day of the week. For yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and I, I love Hitchcock. I mean, we 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 did two Psycho episodes, so you know my love of Hitchcock. But what James Whale is able to do, you know, 10, 20, 30 years before Hitchcock, it's it's unmatched. Yeah. Well, like we were saying, I mean, he's inventing the vocabulary of horror films. Yes. And you know, James Whale more than anyone else is responsible for what gothic horror on cinema was. And yep. You know, and and did it with not just did it, but did it with some style. You know, like that. This movie has just an ass load of style, as many <laughs> uh, important historians have noted. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, because it, it it does have all these flares of of humor and sarcasm, and um, and, and again, I think it was Ian McKellen who said he was talking about you know gods and monsters, which again. We haven't really mentioned that, but if you haven't seen the movie Gods mm-hmm. and Monsters about James Whale, terrific, terrific film. Mm-hmm. Um, it really highlights uh, James Whale and uh, uh, Fessiger's uh, relationship. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the highlights of the film for me. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's so good. And But Ian McKellen, in talking about James Whale, and this movie in particular, was saying, like, it, you know, this was a camp movie. This was a movie that james whale made to kind of tickle himself and (laughs) 
even though it works great as a horror film, it also has this kind of arch comedy to it that isn't like it's not dismissive of, of its own material. It's sort of like you know, there's nothing arm's length about James Whale's direction of this, where it's like this is m- material that's beneath me or something. It's just him, like, kind of understanding the silliness of it, but also really rolling around in the silliness of it. Um, <laughs> it it's just, it, it's terrific. It's just one of those movies that it it's hard to, it, it's hard to explain to someone how every nook and cranny of it has something. Every time I watch it, there's something else I'm kind of delighted by. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like Pretorius repeating the, I, you know, it's the, it's my only vice. You know, that, <laughs> that kind of stuff is just so wonderful. Um, all right, let's let's get to the uh, final segment here, which is three things that you may not know about the Bride of Frankenstein. Um, let's start with El- Elsa Lanchester, who uh, stated that she basically. Uh, base her performance as the bride on geese that she saw in Regent's Park. Yeah, her motions are very bird-like. Yeah, I said robotic earlier, but really, bird uh, is a better descriptive. Yeah, and and she said that uh, they spit and they hissed, and t- the quote from her is, "They're really very nasty creatures." <laughs> So that is that is uh, how she came up with with some of those you know iconic moves. Um, also, the the name of Doctor Pretorius, Septimus Pretorius, which is Latin for Royal Seven, which is a reference to the Seven Deadly Sins, mm-hmm. which uh, is is sort of a, a window into Pretorius himself, someone who would not be bothered too much by uh, breaking any of those or enga- indulging any of those sins. Um, and then uh, to stick with Dr. Pretorius, because again, he's the best character in the movie. Um, during the whole homunculus sequence with all the, the little bottled creatures that he has, when he holds up the, the devil and he says, oh, there's a certain resemblance between me and this one. Um, that was actually an inside joke because the guy who was playing the devil was a guy named Peter Shaw, who was the stand in for Ernest Thesiger in the movie. <laughs> and so it was just a little, again, one of the wonderful little nooks and crannies of this movie is there was an inside joke about his stand in. Um, <laughs> nobody on earth would have ever known that. Anyway, um,. <laughs> Also, uh, one final thing. Just a, a shout out to James Whale for being a good guy. The There is a girl in the movie, in Bride of Frankenstein, who points out a dead body uh, of another little girl. Like, a mother comes up and is like, where's Mary? And she's like, oh, over there. Oh, my God, she's dead. That girl was the girl who was drowned in the original Frankenstein. <laughs> But Whale brought her back because she didn't really get any money for doing that because she didn't have any lines in Frankenstein. And so um, he he cast her so that she would have a one-word line so she would get paid more uh, uh, from the studio because she would have a speaking role instead of just being an extra. Mm-hmm. And... And it's just James Whale being a good guy. Like, sure, he had his problems, but you know what? He's, <laughs> he's a brilliant filmmaker, and he was a good dude. Uh, for the most part, yeah. Most of the stories I hear about James are fairly positive. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, unfortunately, he kind of, you know, like Hollywood was done with him before he was done with Hollywood. But, yeah. um, you know, so, such is life, sadly. Uh, mm. But look, man. I love it so much when you're here to talk about like the big heavy hitters like this, so we can go deep <laughs> on nerdy movie history. Oh my god, this is an absolute treat for me. I we I mean I could definitely go deeper, but I mean I think we hit like the the high level themes of the movie. Um, obviously, have talked about the filmmaking prowess, you know, uh, you know, ad nauseum, and I mean. 
I, I love talking about these movies. I mean, on my uh, most of my shows, we tend to do more obscure horror. So we're not doing a lot of universal classics or like, you know, the, the big the slasher franchises of the 80s, things like that. So um, when I actually get a chance to talk and I said this exact same thing on our on the very first episode when we did Psycho. When I get the chance to talk about one of my favorite movies, it's always an absolute treat for me. And I will drop everything to be here and, you know, talk about movies like this. Um, you know, uh, we did Hell Night 2, which is more of a fun movie, mm -hmm. but I still love it. I, I, I unconditionally love that movie. I don't care. But to be able to talk about, as you said, some of the heavy hitters of horror like Psycho and Bride of Frankenstein... Yeah, uh, I mean, an absolute joy for me. So again, thank you so much for the invite, invite sir. I will 100% be awaiting the next one because I have yet to say no to you, and I don't think I ever will. <laughs> Man, yeah, it's, uh, again, such a pleasure. And, you know, when I think about doing this show, in the back of my head, what I'm thinking is, like, this is my victory lap. Like, eventually, I'm just going to get too old or busy or whatever to do mm -hmm. this. So... I want I want to make sure that I talk about all the movies that I love before you know I hang up the mic and sure. um, and and like I said I just I love talking about movies with you because you always have a, a level of of knowledge and expertise when when talking about these things that I, I adore like I love researching these movies and listening to all the commentaries and then when we start talking and you're like oh yeah yeah I know about that but did you know about this and I'm like yes tell me more. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's really easy when you're talking about a cinematic classic like you know like a psycho or a bride of frankenstein if you ever invite me on to do like sleepaway camp three eh, i might not come off as intelligent but <laughs> yeah yeah no it I, still would probably be a fun conversation though <laughs> look nobody comes out of that clean exactly <laughs> <laughs> nobody looks good on the other side of that conversation uh. um, uh, man, where can people find more of you before I, I, I turn you loose completely? Because uh, I have been on on the some of them programs and had a wonderful time. So, uh, spill, pimp. All right. Well, all three of my main shows are under the No More Room in Hell banner. Um, the main show, of course, No More Room in Hell, a bi-monthly horror review podcast where we look at a couple of obscure films. We're actually going to be recording episode 46 this weekend where we're going to look at two films that I've never even heard of. Go figure. Uh, one called Cut and one called Drive Through. I Actually, I think I've heard of Drive Through and that I think about it. But two movies that I definitely haven't seen. And this is this is why I'm in podcasting, to watch horror films that I've never seen and then get to talk about it right away, get that guttural reaction out, um, you know, before it really has a lot of time to fester in my brain. So, yeah absolute joy there so yeah that's going to be episode 46 of the main show no more room in hell no more room in hell presents creature comforts which our friend Bo has been on twice now um we have episode nine in the can i am in the, i'm in the middle of editing that right now we looked at cloverfield our first found footage creature feature and uh with our guest david garrett jr um, from his solo podcast, which I'm so sorry, I forgot the name of off the top of my head, but um, David was great. Not not as great as Bo, but uh, awesome guest uh, to talk about Cloverfield, especially since one of the hosts on our show hates Cloverfield. I'm not going to say who. I'm going to force you to tune in. But yeah, it actually turned into a fairly lively conversation because I myself love Cloverfield. So um, it was definitely an interesting chat. And then on the third No More Room in Hell show, which is, of course, called Fresh Cuts, that is our weekly show that we do every single Monday where we look at the latest horror releases. Um, on the last episode, we looked at The Sadness, which technically I saw last year as part of Fantasia Fest, but most people in America only recently got it when Shudder dropped it on May 12th, so check out our review for that. It's a long episode. It's one of our longest episodes, and... When you hear how much I and one other member of the team love the sadness, you'll understand why it's one of our longest episodes ever. Um, that's currently available. Our next episode, we're going to be looking at hatching. Um, 
Patching is a film from Finland that I, I was lucky enough to see a few weeks ago when it got a release out here in L.A., like an independent release. But the rest of the country kind of had to wait for its VOD release, which was last week. And folks, if you have not seen Hatching, I would strongly recommend this movie, especially if you're a creature feature lover. I wouldn't necessarily pigeonhole this movie as a creature feature, but there are so many wonderful elements in this from the practical effects to the performances to the emotionality of it it's just a great film hopefully i'm not talking it up too much but um check it out that will be the next episode of fresh cuts and i think we're actually going to be doing a24's men next week um usually with theatrical releases we'll do them the the week they come out um but we kind of had hatching in the can already so we're going to go ahead and do that one and then A24 Men. And then we've got a long stretch of theatrical movies for the mes- the rest of May and most of June. We're actually going to get a theatrical horror release in the theaters. So it's going to be a fun month for Fresh Cuts. We love going to the theater, folks. Excellent. And that's about it for me. Nice, man. Um, all right. Well, I will uh, let you go here. And uh, everybody stick around. I'll be right back to close out the show. Well, there you have it. That's me and Mr. Venom talking about Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, I thought it was great, uh, the conversation we had about that movie. I think the movie's great, too. The movie's amazing. If you've never seen Bride of Frankenstein, what are you doing? You're listening to a horror podcast if you've never seen one of the weirdest and most essential horror movies of all time. This weird blend of like German expressionism and just craziness. Uh, it's It's terrific. What a wonderful movie. Um, the dinner sequence in the crypt alone is is worth its weight in gold, and and yeah, it's a movie you absolutely need to watch. Uh, so in the upfront, I mentioned that there there's going to be a little bit of a change in schedule, and uh, and that is true for a number of reasons. So I'll give you the reasons, and then I'll tell you what the schedule is. Uh, but I, I'll, I will say that we will be releasing something every week. Um, and uh, the reason is uh, a couple of things. I'm going back to school. Uh, if you're a regular listener of this show, you probably heard me mention this. Uh, and I'm going to get a license to teach at uh, a time when I feel like teachers are, are much maligned and, and sort of uh, there's a need for that. And so rather than bitch about it and post memes, I thought, well, what can I do? Well, I could probably teach. And maybe make a difference that way. So that's what I'm doing. And that means that in addition to going to school full time, uh, I will be uh, going to school full time as well. Uh, And then thirdly, my uh, lady friend has kids and I have been a little bit more a part of their lives as well. And I want to make sure that I build out time for that too, because uh, they're... They're great kids. She's a single mom, has been for a while, it has been holding it down. This is no no reflection on the job she is doing or anything, but uh, I'm in a position where I can help her out a little bit, and these kids are great, and uh, so I'm going to be spending a little time with them as well, and all of that means that I just have less time to do the podcasting stuff, and if something's got to give, unfortunately, that's, that's it, right? I've been doing this for... Geez, how many years? Uh, hard to say. Over a decade for sure. Uh, if you factor in uh, all the uh, less blog on the left stuff and that kind of thing. So, at any rate, um, but uh, the so that is the reason I'm having to kind of slow down my schedule some. The cadence of releases is going to slow. Is is the moral of the story? So uh, there will be an, a new episode every week. Still, we're going to have something drop every Wednesday. The difference is that we're not going to have the Wednesday and Friday drops. So that you're going to be getting uh, the main episodes about every other week. And in between, you're going to get Heart of Horror and What You Watch. And, and here and there, there's probably going to be something that I want to talk about and, and we'll drop a special uh, episode for. But, uh, but yeah, so in, instead of having two shows a week and a main episode every week, uh, that's going to stretch out a little bit to main episodes every other week and um the the bonus episodes kind of in that mix to to help uh fill those gaps so uh you're still going to get all the stuff that you have uh, grown used to over the past year of doing the dark parade which we are all, almost at a year of doing the dark parade which is great and 
Uh, so, you know, it's all going to continue. Every Everything is going to uh, keep marching forward. It's just that I got to make a little room for, you know, life. Life happens, people. And, uh, and, and those of you who are, uh, you know, going to school full time and working full time and trying to, uh, manage the rest of life, you know how it is. It's a, it, it's a tough schedule to keep and also build in a little time to just do nothing for a day, you know, to be able to relax and decompress for, from all that stuff. So, um, anyway, thanks for understanding. Uh, like I said, there is still going to be plenty of dark parade stuff coming at you that's never going to change and if you would uh you can you know feel free to rate and review the show on the the podcast catcher of your choice that is always appreciated um like i said not going anywhere and rating and reviewing would help other people hear this uh even on our new weekly schedule uh also uh if you want to drop me a line you can do so on facebook at facebook uh, dot com forward slash groups forward slash dark parade. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at dark parade pod, uh, pod, uh, not, uh, what does pod stand for? The band puddle of dirt people on dopamine. I don't know, but, uh, you can find me on dark parade pod over on, uh, on Twitter. And, uh, uh, you can also find the discord server. And that's honestly where I spend most of my time. And you can find that over on legionpodcasts.com uh, forward slash the dash dark dash parade. Uh, there you can find all the old episodes as well as uh, links to the Twitter and the Discord and the Facebook and all the, the uh, archived episodes and all that stuff. So all of that is there. If, uh, if you want to catch up on the show, if you want to uh, reach out to me um, and that's it so uh the next episode in the tank ladies and gentlemen uh will not be a main episode next wednesday uh it will in fact be a heart of horror with uh k pollock in which we talk about return of the living dead 3 there is a positively shocking story in that discussion that i think you are going to enjoy so yeah that's uh that's all coming your way next week and uh, anyway, stay well. It's summer out there. Get out there. Have a good time. Uh, we'll talk to you real soon. And thank you, as always, uh, for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time. <laughs>